morning, guys. Welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 442, featuring an interview. I think this is the third part, if I'm not mistaken, with Annie Vandermeer. Uh, this time she's talking about Storm of Zahir, of Zahir, <laughs> rather, uh, Neverwinter Nights 2 expansion. She also talks about the Alien RPG that Obsidian was working on, a little behind-the-scenes info on that. She talks about the importance of prototyping, Guild Wars 2, MMO narratives, what it was like working on Destiny, Bungie vs. ArenaNet, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Annie Vandermeer. Now, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, you know, sort of the intentions and why, you know, that, that decision. And also like mm -hmm. to get into this party conversation system, because that, that's pretty cool. <laughs> So, oh my God, it was really hard to to write Star Wars here because it was like, I mean, Mask. It follows Mask, <laughs> like one of the best written yeah. games that has this emotional story. The Empire and these, Strikes Back. Yeah, and I'm Return of the Jedi, and there's like, well, there's gonna be some Ewoks, <laughs> these little fuzzy teddy bears, and I was like, well damn it <laughs> this is gonna be tough i was also told there aren't going to be any companions and i've kind of freaked out about that I, I begged for the cohorts i was like we'll specifically call them cohorts with the different names so that people don't have the same expectations and i was so grateful that they let me you know have those characters in and um the party conversation system was a really cool idea but it was tough to conceptualize because it required all of the writing to be uh, wide, not deep. So it was a sort of situation where to be egalitarian and have a lot of really like chewy kind of options, you couldn't talk to somebody for very long. You couldn't have very in-depth conversations. They were very reactive um, and sort of inclusive in that way, but they weren't, they didn't get, you know, the, and also it was just not like there's not going to be philosophical conversations about the nature of death like there is in in mask like they're just they're fundamentally going to be like you're kind of dm leading you through a story and you know there's this conspiracy and cultists and stuff like that like lighthearted doesn't have to go deep on that one uh so so adapting writing to that and i also really wanted to make sure that the reactive things were prioritized in the proper order and that I, the major fear that I had with that system that I took pains to try to resolve was I didn't want you as a player to feel like your character was just their stats or their chosen class or race. Like this is the elf response. Like I wanted to, to try to have something that was in there as an option that was cool that you felt like, Oh, this is a neat reactive thing to a, to a reason why I built this character. Like class is the most important thing, I think. Um, deities, helpful, like things like that, like how, how things were organized. But uh, oh, it took a long time to write. <laughs> it was a lot of words. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, God, I apologize, especially to the voice actors for the amount of run on sentences that uh, I made happen in that game. <laughs> So it's the sort of thing where it's like I write a lot and then edit it back and there just wasn't as much time to do that. But the, the party conversation system, I think, flowed really well. And it was a sort of neat way to to approach every conversation. That was fundamentally different from how I'd written pretty much any other conversation I had for games. And uh, it required a lot of structuring stuff out in advance. God, I wish I'd had time at that time. It was like notebooks <laughs> that were just scrawled through. Um, there was one point in development where I realized I was on the like fifth branch of a conversation and it was just nonsense. I was like, Annie, nobody's going to care about this. Nobody's going to read this. Like you were just being self-indulgent writing this for yourself. So I deleted the entire thing, took more time to structure it and like put a much better thing back in the game. So it's like good. Now I know how I have to do this. <laughs> what was the rationale behind these big changes from Mask? I mean, no companions, a different conversation system. I mean, what was driving all of this? I think 
I think there was pretty much an understanding that, well, that, that it was going to be the last expansion. Um, I think they wanted an opportunity to, to try to really lean in into the, this is like a D and D campaign. This should feel like a party full of people. Like you're not just one person, you are this group and, and leaning into that. Um, and also it, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort, uh, to write, to write companions. Um, and, uh, like, uh, you need often multiple writers for that. Like George wasn't the only writer on, on, uh, on mask. Um, I know Matt McLean, I think he, I think he wrote some stuff with Oku. I know that, uh, Avalon wrote, uh, Kaylin, I'm sorry, the dove, um, and Ganiev, like it was sort of split responsibilities because there's so much there and the player has certain expectations. And I think they also thought it would be somewhat incompatible having this very deep relationship with like, well, who in your party is like maybe having the romance with this, this character. Like if we could talk to them with another person, they're going to say something completely different um, with no sort of underlined main character. Uh, those interactions kind of would have been potentially off a bit. So having them kind of as hirelings and not letting your relationship get too terribly deep with them um, was a sort of thing that happened by necessity. Um, regarding the, the party conversation system, I think it was, yeah, there was a very, very keen focus on the make this like a D&D game, make this like a tabletop game, make this have that kind of feel. Because in the initial, a lot of the initial pitch and uh, like media that went out about OG uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, that was a lot of the description with it, like the tool set and this is going to feel this way and so on. Um, and for those who didn't feel like that was quite paid off in that game, I think Storms of Here was supposed to be like, here you go. There you go. There's the, this is what you've been waiting for. So. How do you feel about some of the... I don't normally give these reviews too much credence. <laughs> <laughs> especially the big magazines, you know, who who knows? I've heard all kinds of stories. But <laughs> uh, but anyway, I noticed a couple were zeroed in on the way that the game handled death. You know, seemed to be a seemed to be a sticking point for some people and also the uh, amount of random encounters. Yeah. I mean, so do you, are, do you agree with those uh I I those criticisms, that, or they? I think that I liked how how death worked. Um, how did death work? The, well, uh, you wouldn't. Your characters. I don't normally die. let my characters die. I always just. Realize. Yeah. <laughs> if your characters, you know, fifth it an encounter in the the other uh, games that just pop right back to life with like one hit point. Um, but. If they if they died they'd be dead and you'd be essentially like lugging corpse around unless you used a uh, coin of Joaquin or a coin of resurrection that you get by temples of Joaquin which is you know the the goddess of commerce and uh, or if you had like a cleric with resurrection you could you know cast that and bring people back but it was death was not a gimme uh, and I I think that towards the aim of this should feel like a D&D game. This should feel like a tabletop game. There's no shortcuts, um, except for the ones that you have to have because video games are different than tabletop games. Uh, I think that, like, I felt that that was a choice that made sense. Uh, the random encounters were something where it was one of those kind of things you had to do because it was nine months of development. <laughs> And they were easy to sort of reproduce uh, and like a lot easier to do and to test than, say, a module, um, which we definitely wanted to do more of. But there was a sort of limited amount of time. There were so few designers on the, the project. I was a writer and I also designed stuff on it. Uh, like I did West Harbor and Samarak, um, the, the Plantonese logging camp, the Batiri Cave, uh, the actual Samurai itself um, on top of writing everything and redoing the loot system and like a bunch of different stuff. Everybody's wearing a million different hats. 
and there were it was myself uh two other designers and a design intern and like whatever assets we could steal or time we could steal so it was a sort of situation which we had to do easily reproducible stuff fairly quickly and i think that i mean it's 100 percent true that we were taxing the absolute hell out of the engine <laughs> it was like i'm not built for this ow uh, but you know and and you had to have a pretty strong computer back then to to make it run more smoothly um but yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff that we wanted to add that we just couldn't because game development so yeah i there are a lot of random encounters sorry <laughs> so just briefly I, I've, I've seen this game come up a few times in various interviews this this aliens rpg and it's something you know i'm always like ooh. Aliens are, <laughs> sounds great. And of course, there's, I don't know if you uh, I know about this tabletop alien uh, RPG, RPG that just came out. So I wrote it down just in case I forgot, which I, I'm glad I did. <laughs> it's uh, by Free League. It's out of Sweden. Uh, so anyway, there's obviously some interest in alien as a role playing system. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, what do you think about that? Is I don't know what your experience was like working on this Aliens RPG, but is it you know is that something you'd be interested in re- revisiting at some point? I think it would be really cool. I I uh, I officially was on that game for like all of three weeks, but uh, I I had friends uh, who were on it, and I I was following it very closely, and you know doing the given feedback on design documents and so on, um, and. I really, I loved the characters. I thought that there was a sort of promising setup for it. Um, to be to be 100% honest, I was actually kind of shocked that Sega canceled that and not Alpha Protocol. <laughs> because it was in a difficult state when I left. And Alien seemed to be a little bit more solid. But it, was for, it wasn't as far along. Um, they, one of the things that I thought was really cool that they did that I think should be like a lesson going forward for development is they did an early demo of the sound system that was just like a top down two dimensional, like it looked basically just like scratch, like, like lines and uh, whatnot. You'd see like dots, like here's my team. I'm opening a door. Like it makes this sound. The aliens are over here and they're coming in it was basically just a proof of concept for behavior but it was awesome and it worked really well and it gave you a sort of sense of how stuff would work in a much more macro sense in like in 3d it'll it'll function like this um i actually thought of another reason why people tend to not see stuff in development which is it looks bad (laughs) like if any person outside of you know, who hadn't worked on games would see that. They'd be like, the hell is this? Like, why are you, why, why are people excited about this? It looks terrible. Or like a demo level where everything's like this black and white or uh, black, uh, white and gray checkerboard. Um, it'd be like, what? That looks terrible. Or like that early model looks awful. And it's like, you have to kind of see, and you pick this up just by osmosis after a time. You have to kind of look at a basic thing and see possibility, like see potentiality. And um, so seeing that rough draft and working out those little proof of concepts, like do prototype all the time. If you're in game development, like you should be prototyping stuff like all the time. Like documents are nice and everything, but they always say stuff like, you know, let the rubber hit the road or like no, no battle plan survives first contact at the end. No design document will ever come into to being in a actual interactable space 100 percent and i mean that's not a bad thing it means you're adapting and things are changing but like prototypes anyhow off that soapbox uh it was an interesting game and i actually i thought it'd be great i would totally work on on an aliens rpg again like i think that there's there's a lot of possibility there. And I think I took some of the like ideas I had, these little germs, and just like carried them with me uh, into Dead State. Uh, because there is a sort of mm-hmm. similar situations, I guess. Like, you get an alien in you or you get bit. Like, you, you have a timer over your head oh. to a very messy result. And 
having play like the the sort of impact that has with uh characters going i'm gonna die this is inevitable and like how how different characters take that is like uh it's like an acting exercise where it's like ah sweet pathos <laughs> this is fun to write in a very macabre kind of way <laughs> I often thought it'd be fun to have an alien game from the perspective of Jones, the, oh, man. the cat. <laughs> like, what's that? Like among the Jones? What's Jones been doing this whole movie? You know? <laughs> Hiding like a wise, wise cat. <laughs> uh, so let's get in uh, to Guild Wars Two a little bit, which I think that's where you went after aliens, right? Or is there something in between? Yep. Uh, so I remember playing this when it came out. You know, it's a huge deal. And everybody's saying, oh, <laughs> finally, the WoW killer is here, you know. <laughs> uh, Guild Wars 2. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I'd like to hear more about this project, what was going on, and sort of what it was like transitioning from the uh, CRPGs into this MMORPG space. Uh, the funny thing is, and I think it was a really good thing when I was, I, if you had asked me a year before... I started there. If I would ever work on an MMO, I'd be like, no, no way. It's not for me because I saw them as primarily just not really vectors for, for story that they were mostly systems, even though I really loved WoW and I was playing a lot of WoW. Um, but when I was interviewing at ArenaNet, they were like, we really want to put the RPG in back into MMORPG. And they showed me their plans for the personal story and uh, and there is so much like chewy, awesome lore in that world. Not just in like, oh, I found a book and I read it. Like it's sitting everywhere. <laughs> and the investment in that that the game had was was exciting. Like I, I went from being like, oh, maybe to I really want to work on this game. Please let me work on your game, please. Uh, and and working on the the personal story was I mean even though the team was fairly large 75 people I'm just trying to think design department was like 30 something the personal story team was six people or uh six designers and two writers and one embedded QA and having that sort of focus of like, like we are telling an overarching story here that needs to hit on these other points of the game um that was it was really fun and the world felt really malleable and the amount, like I mentioned before, the any unlocked door, I'm going to, I'm going to creep in there <laughs> and start messing with stuff. I, uh, I ended up having a lot of contributions to the lore and the way this larger world worked and, uh, that were really exciting. And I started, I did some art again. <laughs> they also had like, a, but it was purely internal, this composite system, um, which was basically paper doll dressing up characters, and, and the personal story had a lot of a lot of characters to it. And I was getting pretty overwhelmed, so they're like, "Oh, you do it!" Like, really, me? Okay, let's go. Uh, so I made a lot of the appearances of the characters in the personal story, and worked on a bunch of other stuff. And it felt like like I like a, a project in which I can I can dig in and help where help is needed and I can be like I, I super dig on being useful and I always felt useful and engaged on that project like I had also said afterwards uh if there's any sort of setting I would go back to it'd be Tyria which is funny because I'm at arena net again now <laughs> back in Tyria so the thing I said I'm doing it so so do you feel like they managed to crack that nut of having that strong narrative I think so. I think they definitely have. I think that actually the the amount of investment that Arena has put into the narrative in in Guild Wars 2 is is kind of staggering. I think it's beyond any other MMO out there and I know favoritism, but it's I can see the level of investment that's happening there. Like the they've been keeping up to date on the personal story and the personal story flows into these expansions and um it's it's been consistent and i think i think the the downside of that is it can be a little bit daunting for new players to jump into this massive well of lore mm -hmm. and so having a sort of situation in which 
it still feels approachable. Like it's, it's, it's still deep and rich and there's a lot there, but I don't feel like as a player, if I get into it and don't a hundred percent know what's going on or don't know all the backstory and stuff, I don't feel hindered by that in any way that I'm excited to find out more and not obligated to find out more. Like I, uh, one of my sort of goals in my, like that has gone through my entire career is to catch what I call the press a crowd, which is, uh, okay, whatever, shut up, stop talking, whatever, just hit an a A crowd. Yeah. Get (laughs) I don't care. How do you make somebody who fundamentally doesn't care about the story actually care about the story? And a lot of times I think it's that people just don't feel like, it applies to them that they're they don't have an emotional connection with it because the game is not going out of its way to to try to build one with you and so and that's a consistent concern that i have to be like okay we can tell these really awesome stories that's really cool we should keep doing that also how do we make this less overwhelming because <laughs> there is a lot there's a lot back here it's like tomes and tomes like how do we make the cliffs notes of this like what's your sort of stair step to getting somebody who feels overwhelmed or who might not care to care a little bit and then oh, and then they're a big fan yeah mission accomplished that's the hope <laughs> that seems to be the the critical thing especially with an MMO I've always kind of thought about those with you know with the CRPGs it's like everything's sort of wrapped around the player mm-hmm. whereas in an MMO it's almost feels a lot often feels like a sort of one size fits all you know experience we got to get our, everybody's got to go through the game you know and you're in there with all these other people i think somebody's described i forget who it was what they were talking about the star wars mmos and they're saying well everybody wants to be luke skywalker but not everybody can be luke skywalker yeah <laughs> so so how do you juggle that uh i call it the i want to be the guy idea yeah. I want to be the guy who, I and guy. <laughs> I, I was actually kind of, I was startled that they were making an Elder Scrolls MMO because my relationship to that series of games, and I know a lot of people's is, uh, you can be the guy. You are, you are the guy that does everything. Like I'm the head of the Mages College, and also the Dark Brotherhood, and also the Adventures, and I do this, <laughs> I do that. I am a Jarl in every freaking like town. Like I am the guy. And that was something that was so like core to the experience. I was like, how do you, yeah, exactly. In an MMO, everybody's the guy. Like, what do you, how do you have, how do you make that experience stand out? And I think it's a sort of situation where it's like, you make the player make choices and choices are, are kind of terrifying to do because that's cut off content. Um, And if you are pushed towards replayability, um, or I should be like an altaholic or whatever, having alts and everything. That's that's part of the sort of like, well, it's not that bad. You made a choice, but now you can make a different one. Um, but you're in, if you're in a sort of situation where you're kind of counted on just keeping one character, especially if there's a constant flow of content, you don't want to have to keep replaying it. Um, it's a difficult thing. So I was impressed that, um, that Guild Wars 2 focused on player choices and and had an investment in terms of like oh yeah if i if i choose to play a char instead of a a human or a silvari my story starting out is totally different like if i i make a choice to be in the ash legion instead of the blood legion i'm actually playing different content um and if i join this order like the order of whispers it's all spies and secret stuff i can have special like dialogue options with random NPCs, like all, all little passphrases and like, that's awesome. And I think that that requires not just a one-time commitment. It requires a consistent design philosophy of, of commitment Mm -hmm. to something, to, to trying to make things stand out. Like everybody's going to call every NPC because lines have to be written, has to call you commander because you were the commander of the pact and so on. Um, there is still, and I was really happy to see this commitment by the narrative team to sit down and go, as a player, if I'm approaching this, when do I expect it to be different? When do I expect, like, 
um, like the game to notice that I did something different. When do I that like, oh, wow, like this, I'm talking to another Iron Legion char, like they call out that we're in the same Legion. I expect that as a player, like maybe not expect that, but it is in my head that this is how I built that character. And to have a moment where a character remembers that or reacts that way is is telling it's not just spill reactivity everywhere because god that takes forever and most of it isn't seen it's just where are the points where it makes an impact mm -hmm. like find those points and and stick to it <laughs> stick that landing over and over and over again um and that is a sort of situation in which like you don't have to be the guy but you are your guy and that the game goes yeah, you are. You are special. You you have made these choices. We understand and we remember. So, uh, I mean, in, in speaking of the, like, I want to be the guy, that you should go to the Mages College, like, random shout. Like, it ceased to mean anything to me that it, the game reacted to. And I'm just crapping on Skyrim. I love Skyrim. I just want to say, uh, it's neat that the game noticed I was interested in magic, but the fact that they didn't also notice, I'm the dean of that college thing like, bugged me. <laughs> like, you can notice what I'm doing mechanically, but you can't pick up on the fact that I completed that quest. Like, that, I mean, that is a sort of consequence of being the guy everywhere. It has given you option A, and to have a game that has choices is option B, that you can't be the guy for everything. You just got to underline that. Like, your choices matter. We see you. <laughs> Well, how did this experience compare to uh, working on Destiny uh, for Bungie? Is Destiny totally was totally weird... different. <laughs> yeah, it was weird because um, there was actually a lot of similarities uh, in in like goal and the team I was a part of. Uh, after being on the Living World, or uh, excuse me, the personal story team on Guild Wars 2, I transitioned to the Living World team, which was a lot about doing events. And then I went over to work on Destiny, and we worked on events, <laughs> and it was another small, like, focused team. Um, so I felt like, oh, yeah, this is a bunch of carryover. And it was also a sort of situation in which I felt like when I was joining ArenaNet, I have this single player RPG experience that I can bring into this MMO. And then it was like, oh, okay, I have this multiplayer MMO experience that I could help bring into this new situation. Like, this is how you should write these bark lines in a event because when you think of just writing something that's like, you know, a linear kind of playthrough, you don't think about like, well, I'm playing this event and then this person comes in, like, what do they hear that's different? Like, it took me a long time on Guild Wars 2 to kind of crack through my single player mindset to like, oh, this is what multiplayer means and this is how you th have to think about it. So I I had been through that journey and I was like, and now I will guide you. <laughs> it was also a sort of situation in which, I mean, uh, ArenaNet was pretty big at that time, but Bungie's gargantuan. And it was, it was cool and very intimidating to be part of such a massive massive team and uh the the feel of every developer the culture of every developer is very different and um uh wow but bungees is like hey like they call you a knight i have a sword they gave me a sword <laughs> i mean it's a wooden sword but they gave me a flipping sword and like <laughs> like that's a big deal it is the sort of situation where even if you're there a short time as i was there 10 months like they're like welcome to this great like project that we're working on like it's there's a lot of um esprit de corps there that was that was really unique and that was like this is this is heady <laughs> it's a wow. lot of it's quite the experience hmm. <laughs> and it definitely motivates you to to get the feel that you were working on something very big um and uh which you know it, it can be a lot of fun and it also can be overwhelming uh, so, so I think it was really interesting. And I, again, did a bunch of smattering of different stuff on there. Um, it was a, it's a very technically focused company. So I felt like I was at a slight disadvantage for not having like a computer science degree, uh, in my design sort of thing. Like there's, there's different expectations for designers at every single place. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I learned a lot there and it actually helped motivate me to learn more technical stuff going forward. And it was also like back when a push to like learn, learn more scripting for the passenger eventually. So it was fun. It was, a, it was quite the experience. And oh, I got to a, hear oh, go Peter English. Sorry. Oh, what? <laughs> Well, like the, the, the early lines and stuff like that, I wrote a bunch of temp texts and it was like, wow, okay, Peter Dinklage might be reading something I wrote. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay. That's <laughs> surreal. <laughs> I don't know if it'll stay in the game, but what is my life? So. <laughs> was that the biggest company you'd worked for to that point? Absolutely. By an order of magnitude. Order of magnitude. Well, I guess I just didn't realize how big that team really was. It's so big. It's even bigger now. It was, I think, 500 some people when I worked there. And I've been coming from ArenaNet, which I think was about 200 people. So, well, maybe not an order of magnitude by actual math terms, but, you it know, like over you twice like the, the size. Sounds like you prefer <laughs> the smaller sizes. I think that, I think it's a lot about how the development of something works. Like if it's the right sort of structure of how something gets made, if, if, like, it was really cool being on essentially a small team within a team. Like, the events team was not that big, and the stuff that we could do was, you know, got to work as a sort of the proof of concepts and all the stuff. The work was done in a, a sort of small space, and then we got to coordinate with specific other people to get it in the larger world. I think that was that functions really well, and I think that's kind of how you have to get best results out of a large team. Otherwise, like... It is overwhelming, but um, but to be totally honest, like it was, <laughs> it was a little big. It was a little big. All right, so I probably got more questions from from viewers about uh, Dead State more than anything else, and uh, yeah, so I, like, what was it like working on that, and you know, what do you think went well, what didn't go so well? And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Sorry about last week. As I said, sometimes the uh, the uh, day job just takes over, overwhelms my ability to put the episodes out. So uh, sorry about that, but we should be good because uh, we have a spring break here next week. Uh, so that will finally give me a chance to catch back up. So uh, look for an episode, uh, probably one more episode with Annie, and then we'll move on to Kevin Saunders. And I might even do a Google Hangout there sometime in early March, so stay tuned for that. A lot of exciting stuff here at Mad Chat. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very Lee much uh, for supporting this show, for keeping Mad Chat on the air. Could not, would not do it without you. So thank you very much for your support. Uh, if, for whatever crazy reason you have not stepped up to the plate, now is your opportunity. Go to that lovely link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Become a patron. One buck an episode. You're good to go. Really appreciate that. Of course, you want to, you know, put in more. Uh, even better, you can be one of the big rats <laughs> of the Rat Pack. Um, of course, there's pay, uh, PayPal settings. Uh, uh, of course, if you're uh, supporting the show by tweeting, retweeting, uh, talking about it on forums, whatever it is you do, uh, believe me, I see that stuff and really, really appreciate it. It makes my day to see that. So uh, thank you once again. Really appreciate your support putting these episodes together. All right, so what about that news from the Matt Cave? Let me put down my remote control. I feel like I need two hands for this. Uh, Larian has revealed the gameplay for their new expansion pack to Divinity Original Sin 2 called Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> okay, just a little joke there. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, though. Just take a look at the trailer. I'll, I'll show a little bit here. Uh, so Larian, this is from Sam Makovich of Ars Technica. Uh, so he's talking about how they built... Baldur's Gate 3 on top of 2014's D&D 5e rule set. 
Uh, so a lot of this stuff is taking place, the roles are taking place behind the scenes. Uh, but he says, in action, the gameplay reveal the gameplay reveal emphasizes character movement that looks more like World of Warcraft-like systems than D&D handlers, which is the coast implemented when they rolled out the D&D 4E rule set. Ouch. So I guess he's saying this is really more like 4E than 5E, uh, for what that's worth. Of course, we're a long ways from the system from the original game uh, with the good old Thacko-derived AD&D systems. Uh, this does have turn-based combat. You know, I know there was a little bit of uh, discussion back and forth about that. Uh, I personally like uh, turn-based. It's my preferred thing. Uh, that said, it is Baldur's Gate. You know, what are you going to do? If I had been Larian, I would have... You know, put it this way, I would like to have seen Larian try uh, a real-time with pause system, just innovate on that, see what, you know, they're really good at the turn base, but I'd like to see their take on the real-time with pause. But, you know, this, you know, I'm not going to rule it out because of that, uh, but it is a question of, it, is it truly Baldur's Gate if it has turn based? I don't know. Uh, you know, they're emphasizing here as well the way conversations work in the game. It leaves a little bit more to the imagination than just having you pick phrases, so that, that sounds good. Uh, but anyway, uh, some of the stuff I was looking at, it uh, I think it's fair to say this looks a whole lot more like Divinity Original Sin 2 than Baldur's Gate. I mean, they even are reusing a lot of the icons and interface stuff at this point. Uh, if you really love... Uh, you know, Divinity Original Sin 2, which a lot of people, including me, do. It's a great game. It's probably less of a problem. Uh, if you did uh, kind of want something more in the spirit of the original game, though, you know, you might be disappointed, at least at this point, with the look of this. Of course, there's a lot of fudging about, well, this is kind of early footage, and it will change a lot before the final release. Uh, so I don't know what to expect. Uh, I will say if it's, you know, if it's as good as uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, I will be happy with this. <laughs> you know, even if it's not exactly like Baldur's Gate, or even if it turns out to feel like a very different game, still could be worth playing, you know, still could be worth, uh, certainly worth purchasing. So I'm just going to keep my mind open at this point, try not to get too caught up with the, uh, this discussion of how faithful it is to the original. You know, just trying to give this new thing a chance, see what Larian does. Now, they've really yet to disappoint me in any big way. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But again, love to hear your take on this. Do you feel like uh, Larian is doing a good job and that this, you're excited to play uh, Baldur's Gate 3? Or uh, are you turned off by it for some reason? Just let me know. Love to uh, re hash that out in the comments. Uh, second bit of news. Uh, I somehow had a brain fart. I completely forgot to mention this last time. But <laughs> there's a Kickstarter for the Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous game. Now, I know I've talked about it before, I think before they did the Kickstarter, but anyway, it's still got nine days uh, left to go on that. Uh, I will assume you're familiar with Pathfinder. I did a video on it not too long ago about the first game. Really loved it, really excited. Yes, it had its problems, <laughs> but I think they're going to uh, really nail it with the second one. Uh, so let's see. It's They were trying to get, I don't know, some little bit of money. I forget, I didn't write down the amount, but they're currently over $1.4 million dollars well over their uh, original goal. Now, I signed up to get this uh, boxed edition. It's $55 for that, which is, you know, if you look at some of these other Kickstarters, that's actually a really good price for a boxed edition. A lot of them want at least 100 bucks or more for the box. This is only 55 bucks, So I'd say that's, that's the one that I would go for if I were you. Uh, if you uh, do want to save some money, though, it's $28 for the digital digital download. That's hard for me to say that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a little bit cheaper than, you know, I think it's probably better to go ahead now if you know you're going to want this uh, than waiting for the uh, release. And let's see. Yeah, so I've already covered this. I won't repeat all the stuff I said before. It just, it looks like they're really trying to expand on these ideas from the first game. They've got something they're calling Mythic Paths here. Now they've got, uh, they're trying to work harder to make that story, wrap around the characters, more dynamic stuff going on with the uh, player relationships and companions and so on. Uh, anyway, I'll let you read that on your own, but uh, it's nine days left as I'm recording this, so I don't know when you'll be watching this, but you know the time to act is probably sooner rather than later. All right, and then to wrap up here, as you probably noticed my shirt here, kind of a sad bit of news. Uh, let me see if I can pronounce his name correctly. Kajahisa Hashimoto. 
actually the creator of the code that's on this shirt, the Konami code, uh, passed away recently. Uh, so this up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A. Uh, it's a pretty famous cheat code. Uh, been in lots of uh, different video games. It's a lot of uh, Easter eggs around this code. Uh, so anyway, I just thought that was, uh, you know, of course I'm sad that he's passed on, but I think in another, in another sense, though, it's kind of cool to have a legacy like that. <laughs> you know, how many of us, how many times have we typed in that code? Never really thought about who put that code in there, or what that person was, was like. Uh, so that, that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty fun. I hope we all have a legacy like that. Uh, you know, people to fondly remember us uh, when we have moved on. All right, I think that will uh, do it for the news. Uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking up for quotes about uh, teamwork and success and being creative, you know, things in that vein. And I found one by uh, Thomas Edison. You probably know, have heard of him, really famous inventor. Uh, anyway, I thought he has a pretty, I really like this quote from him. He's got a bunch actually. You, know, you could probably have a whole book of nothing but Thomas Edison quotes. But anyway, this one goes something like this. Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. I don't believe that any system is totally secure.